Welcome to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and we're here to preserve and promote culture, one weekly conversation at a time. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show through iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, Google Play, and a whole bunch of other venues. Just visit our sites, chimeraobscura.com slash vm or vmspod.com to find more information, along with our RSS feed. Well, I, um, I should not be posting an episode right now, but, um, I'm going to be away tomorrow and I don't want to push this week's episode off too far. Um, I shouldn't post this because I'm in the midst of some, some heavy grieving right now. Uh, we had to say goodbye to our greyhound, Bendico, yesterday after a broken leg on Sunday, uh, revealed osteosarcoma. Greyhounds are prone to that. And at nearly 11 years old, Benny's chances of surviving amputation and treatment and all that were low. Um, problem was I had hit the road for a, a business event in Boston, uh, like an hour or two before he broke his leg. So my wife was coping with this all by herself. I took the train up, and if I had been driving, I probably would have turned around, driven home, and, and helped. But um, instead, I, I stayed overnight, gave my presentation at the, the trade show the next day, got the news. Um, they, they finished diagnosing him uh, in, in, you know, around, around the time I was finishing up my thing. And... Um, and Amy and I decided that it was more important for uh, Benny's suffering to end than for everyone to wait until I could get to the clinic from the train from Boston to Stanford, the drive and, and all that stuff. So so that's what they did. Um, she texted me during my train ride, sent pictures uh, while she was waiting with him. They gave her a lot of time to, to say goodbye. And, uh, and then he was gone. Um, when I got home a couple hours later, I have been crying a lot since this first started on, on Sunday afternoon or evening. Um, I cried pretty hard right before this, sort of hoping that it would help me get this out without breaking down. Um, anyway, I, uh, I miss my boy. So, yeah, I shouldn't put an episode out right now because... I don't want to scant this week's guest, but, you know, it's this is what I do, and this is part of what um, makes me whole, or makes me a real person, so uh, you get this. So. Anyway, let's get to this week's show. My guest is the artist Frances Jetter, and she has this beautiful new book out now. It's called Amalgam. Uh, A-M-A-L-G-A-M. Uh, subtitle is An Immigrant, His Labor Union, and His American Family in Brooklyn. It's from Fanographics Underground. Amalgam's a graphic novel, and it's centered on Francis's grandfather, Avram, Abe, uh, you know, old country, um, and who he emigrated from Poland to America, um, became a union advocate in the garment trade, Built a family that he ruled over with a with an iron fist. Um, well, the book explores history and family and the labor movement and and the history of Jews in Europe and out of Europe, um, and and the the images and symbols that that carry through generations. There are some key ones in the the book. Key being a, a unintended pun because doors and and uh, doorless doorways are are part of this and what happens through the keyhole, what happens with the hinges. <sighs> Francis's artwork is um, well in the book. It's multimedia. It's primarily the the lino cut prints that Francis is famed for. She has done decades and decades of, of incredible work with, with lino cuts, largely as editorial illustration, which we'll talk about. Um, but the book also incorporates some painting, 
objects and text. Some of the text is carved in as lino cuts. Other things are, are sort of standalone. And it all integrates into this this story of of family and and America. And her her lino cuts really are just mind blowingly detailed and, and expressionistic. Like almost every page, you will just plot at at what goes into these these drawings and their their printing and reproduction. Um, God, it, it's amazing. And as we talk about the the writing, both the the prose that I was talking about, the text and and what writing is in comics, the the whole gestalt of storytelling. She's got a total mastery of that form. It's it's really breathtaking to to see. Because there's there's an awful lot going on within Amalgam. And Francis does this tremendous job of exploring history on a, a family and a, a macro level while bringing in her her personal connection to it. Uh the the perspective of an artist who has come on the scene late or later or just you know by the nature of of generations of family but but is charged with bringing us this story telling us about about her family's arrival in America what it means what labor does and what what American history has been and how things have changed and we hope might change in future I should note we recorded this before the election so when we talk about being hopeful about unions it has a very different perspective than than it does now but I'll say there are just moments of pure poetry throughout this book. And it's it's all wed to a, a really intricate and amazing production of an actual physical book. It, it's oversized, like 11 by 14. I've, I've got a perfect spot on my shelf for it right next to the, the big Joe Coleman collection that Fanographics also put out. But the whole book, the the, the weight of it, the... The significance of it as a physical object from page to page, it's 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 really amazing experience. Amalgam is is breathtaking and, and Francis will go into <clears throat> what took what why it was a twelve year long project for her. But I'm just thankful that uh two of my guests, uh Joe Chardello first and then Thomas Woodruff, uh, both brought this one to my attention. I didn't know Francis. They both hit me up with, Oh my god, Gil, you have to sit down with her and get her on the show. And I'm very thankful that I did. Um, so go get Amalgam, uh, an immigrant, his labor union, and his American family in Brooklyn. It's from Francis Jetter. Francis is F-R-A-N-C-E-S. Those caveats go, it's New York City, so there's a little noise around that. And her cat meandered around and at one point tried to climb into my podcast gear bag. But um, otherwise, we were good. Now here's Francis's bio from the book. Political and social subject matter have long been the focus of Frances Jetter's prints, artist books, and drawings. Her images of illustrated articles and publications, including the New York Times, the Washington Post, Time, The Nation, The Village Voice, and The Progressive. She also illustrated books for the Franklin Library, ads for Autobahn, and book jackets from major publishers. Her work has been exhibited in the United States, Europe, and Asia. Her prints are in the permanent collections at the Fogg Art Museum at Harvard, Detroit Institute of Arts, the New York Public Library, and Grinnell College Print and Drawing Study Room. She has taught at the School of Visual Arts since 1979. And now, the Virtual Memories Conversation with Francis Jetter. How did Amalgam start? Oh. Uh, well, you know, I'd done editorial illustration for years and then needed to get things changed up, like this, the scale of things and even the subject matter mm -hmm. uh, and the time, because everything was due overnight, or Back a lot the, of the, the things were due overnight yeah. then, and I loved staying up all night and doing it, and then suddenly I didn't love it so much <laughs> anymore. And the input got worse, and there was a time, I guess it was mostly in the 80s, where there was a lot of freedom, and editors left it alone, and art directors had more say, mm -hmm. and that was great. But things changed for me. I really wanted to get more of the personal mixed in with the political. Uh, and I started to do artist books, among other things, where they were larger. Um, 
and then it got more focused on the family and their time in history and the mixture of that. And I guess that's what that's how I got started on that. And then it just kept getting larger and evolving yeah. and I really didn't expect it to go on for more than 12 years. Yeah. You know, because it felt finished at certain points and then it was clear it wasn't. What was that like for you? The, those instances of and was it your first I don't want to say narrative, but it's it's somewhat narrative. No, poem. there was a book called Cry Uncle, which mm-hmm. was about torture uh, in Guantanamo and Bagram and other sites um, that also large images and a story that went with it based on Orwell. And I'm very influenced by Orwell anyway through mm-hmm. the years. Uh, and at that point, these were artist books. I had no intention of getting anything into, you know, being a regular book that yeah. would be out there. Uh, so that ended up changing with Malcolm. Uh, so, but beforehand, you know, like there's this dual situation that I have with always loving newsprint and not caring if it was garbage the next day <laughs> yeah. and having it out there. And that was my passion. But I also love beautiful handmade Japanese paper. Um, this book was printed on Canadian handmade paper, <laughs> and um, they made wonderful paper. Uh, but I, I guess I was always closest to the Japanese paper with the translucence and the different uh, kind of very subtle imprint on the paper for, from how it's made. So having things full size and as prints um, mattered a great deal to me. It it matters in some way now, and having the things in collections and preserved. Um, But also, I'm at heart somebody who's, I'm not embarrassed to say an illustrator, which seems to be a dirty word for some people. Um, I'm not. The idea that something is really out in the world matters a lot to me. It also, in the past for me, has gone with really important articles that I felt needed to be read and the picture would call some attention to the article so I thought before realizing that some people didn't even see that there was a drawing on the page (laughs) it was a a tough uh, tough thing to accept along those lines or do you feel like well I'm doing my job you know like I've sat with with Stephen Heller and people like that who've assigned these sorts of things with the amount of love they would put into like the page layout, fitting the illustration and the text and making it all integrated. It means something to us. And you, you wonder how much it matters to, to, you know, the lay reader and how much of the stuff now goes digital and, and just disappears, yeah. I guess. But, yeah. I, it has to matter the person making it first Yeah, and whoever gets it or doesn't, or whoever hates it, you know, that it's a reaction. Just, yeah. Yeah. I don't really care. I, I like that it's out there. So how the book take shape? What was the what was the original conception versus and should we consider this final final or is it something that's somewhat um, evolving is, in your head? No, it's final for what it is. Yeah. Uh, and some things will come out of it that will probably go into some other, the next thing, mm-hmm. which I hope doesn't take 12 years. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, what yeah. was the, the longest part of it for you? What took 12 years? I mean, the art itself is so gorgeous, and I can't imagine the time that goes into making every one of these, but, you know. Well, it also involved going into a print shop, and I work with this terrific artist and printer, and... He has great sensitivity towards getting what I want out of it and what can be gotten out of it. And people think it's a simple process. It isn't. It's very basic. Any little kid can make it. It's like a potato, cutting up a potato. But getting um, small areas that have a lot of detail 
to get that and then to get black areas. And then we mess around with all sorts of color and it's called Chine Collet. And every incremental thing seems major in doing it. Yeah. When afterwards, I sometimes can't tell the difference <laughs> a year later, but at the time, yeah. we spend so much effort on trying everything out and seeing what seems monumental, even yeah. who knows if it really is. But um, so I'm kind of getting lost in, as Just, you said, what, what, what took 12 years, but, but yeah. That's, okay, that's, but some of yeah. these, like I'd go in on Mondays when mm -hmm. he was free to print. He runs the Robert Blackburn Printmaking Workshop, and Robert Blackburn was an incredible man. Mm -hmm. um, now he's long dead. Mm -hmm. And he kept that going, so now it's run by this foundation. Uh, so we'd go in there, and sometimes even that eight-hour printing would extend to the next week or the week after if it wasn't all done, because we were auditioning for an edition of about 15 books. So it was really intensive, and somebody else cut the parts out. Um, two people uh, did most of this. Terrific, um, Ian and, and Faye later on. So those things took a while to get together. Uh, some of the, the cutting could take three weeks because unlike the old deadlines, I just would stop when I couldn't yeah. do what I wanted and sometimes they were patched if a face didn't really feel like the person who you know, had known, you know, family member for so many years, and you want to get the feeling of the life of the person in, even if that person was a child in the particular depiction. So that lasted a while. Um, it expanded because I guess I didn't intend it all to have, I didn't intend it to be a memoir, mm -hmm. or that I would be in it. Yeah. And it evolved into that. And that changed it around also, because it became something about influences and memory more than it had been. Yeah. Then there was a fellowship I had at the library, the Coleman Center, and they were all writers. I was the only um, visual person there. Uh, and that opened up all sorts of things with a historian questioning some of what I thought about the first page and what had happened in Russian history and in Poland, uh, where Russia had taken over Poland. Uh, so then that led to going to the maps division and seeing actual maps there and going to the Durat, where I found out more about some of the history of Jews in Poland, uh, and then passing a case with um, Andrew Carnegie, who had given so much to libraries, and it was celebrating him, and I was reading a book about the Homestead Massacre, yeah. and yeah. that he allowed Frick to do whatever he wanted. Carnegie was in Europe at the time, yeah. and this whole terrific story, and that's led to that led to a section that I called "Meetings in Hell," um, with history of open doors and closed doors, and all these terrible things in in labor history, uh, because um, Carnegie wanted to meet with Frick, with Frick after not they hadn't spoken in many years, um, and Frick replied to his note, yeah, we'll meet, I'll meet you in hell where we're both going. Uh, but Carnegie yeah. regretted the deaths and what happened, and he said, the man who dies rich dies disgraced. So that was yeah. one of those stories. Sure. Uh, how much of this, not just the, the historical episodes like that, but how much of the, the, the theme started to become clear to you only in process. How much did you know going in that this is what I'm, what's under what I'm writing about versus things that started emerging, like the the open and, and closed doors, like like triangle and your own the the, the family's house and and you know the, the way these things start to to echo each other. 
Some of it was clear to me, but a lot of it wasn't. Mm -hmm. And then in some of the summation, like the piece on the back of the book that yeah. the people at Fantagraphics put together at the end, right. mostly Gary Groth wrote this, and the idea of memory and the ghosts from the past and all of that had not occurred to me. <laughs> and after reading that, it suddenly became clear that... Oh, that that's was, what I was doing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It is funny how we don't... We don't see it when we're too inside the work yeah. that it can be, oh, yeah, no, this is the, the, the observer is necessary. The audience needs to, to bring something to it, too. Yes. But tell me about that, that sense of realizing you needed to be part of it without making yourself overt, overt as a presence, but that your story was some, necessary. At some point, I'd spoken to Nick Bertozzi, and, you know, he had... He was excited about the images, and this is earlier, you know, wasn't when it was mostly put together. And he said something like, well, you know, what about you being formed by the other people in your life and the rest of it? And the idea of memoir, you know, even though I love some memoirs that yeah. people write, the idea was embarrassing to me. I, um, I get you, because so yeah. many of my guests have had that same thing, usually in nonfiction work. Like, my editor insisted I start bringing myself into it, and I was really uncomfortable. But it turned out to be fruitful for the, the, the way the book worked for a lot of them. But, yeah, most of my, my guests are not people who want to, mm -hmm. funnily enough, not people who want to reveal themselves, even though we're sitting together, you know, <laughs> talking about their lives. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Maybe just not in print, I guess. But <laughs> the process of bringing it to print, like you mentioned, the you know the the challenges of the the print shop aspect of it, the challenges of reproduction, getting it to look the way you wanted it to look. Um. Well, I couldn't be more excited about how it turned out as yeah. a physical. Um, thing, how it yeah. ended up coming together. The things that they did, the embossing on the cover was something that was a complete wonderful surprise. Uh, what happened was that the photographer um, you know, did good work with high DPI, which they needed. Uh, but then we um, got the pictures. I guess we um, saturated them a little bit more. We got them a little bit darker for the yeah, book. That's what I, I figure. Reproduction is yeah. going to involve. Um, my yeah. wife's a photographer. I understand color correction and everything yeah. else for you know, the various uh -huh. medium she she shoots for. But but yeah. But yeah, well, then he's great at design. Ah. Earth, my yeah. husband. Um, I mean, he. Unpaid labor is as, great. When you, when you can get unpaid labor to do your stuff, it it, it's is. fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> Not easy for the other person yeah, going through you know. this for years. But oh, it's still, for love. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so a number of the things were, were retouched. Um, all of a sudden, I couldn't use the Billie Holiday words um, to God bless the child about empty pockets because getting the rights to that yeah. was just not only difficult, but was going to be expensive and go on and on. And so that had to be retouched. And originally they were rubber stamps and it was a big process in the printmaking. And that, well, this is what he does for work. He's a photographer now and he has worked as a designer and he's great at retouching. So he retouched the new words in. So they looked like yeah, they it's were printed. integrated. Gotcha. So that happened mm -hmm. in the number of cases in the book. Yeah. Um, what else can I tell you about that? Uh, at a certain point, things needed to be better connected. So those images also, I, I made new images for that, for yeah. connecting the parts. Mm -hmm. um, the epilogue also... Um, that changed when, you know, the print shop was completely shut down like everything else was during the pandemic. 
But I started to have doubts about some aspects of the book and wondered if it was relevant at all. And all these things that went on when not working. And I'm really a mess when I'm not working at at all. I was uh, teaching and uh, I still I am teaching. Yeah, yeah. But um, mm-hmm. that was setting in. And so some things ended up getting changed around. And uh, when the print shop was open again, we did things with lithography. And so that was put together in a different way because it still interests me. Drawing is the main thing for me, not the cutting. Uh, the My work materializes and ends up being printmaking and sometimes in other forms, but it starts with the drawing, and if the drawing doesn't work, it's not going to be anything but decoration. Where'd art begin for you? As a small child. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And developing the lino cut mode uh, that you work in? That was partially in, um, in art school, uh, but then when starting to work, there are a couple of things that I did, and somebody said, what is going to look good in my magazine? And at that point, they didn't have much color anywhere. It was mostly black and white. Mm-hmm. So that's what I did. Yeah. And keeping with it, though, I mean, it becomes such a, it's a you thing. It becomes a style that is, you know, intrinsically tied to you, not just a style, but a, a genre that you're working in. Um, you know, sticking with it and, and making it your, your voice. Was that really a, was there a conscious moment of that or was just, I'm really good with this? And... Well, it's what happens is that when you show certain things, that's what you get hired to do. Yeah. And yeah. then when some of it got suffocating for me, or I felt there was nothing more to discover. It was feeling like a dead end. I then did other things. Um, like I took a course in etching, and I took courses in um, metal sculpture because the school had a foundry, so I could take classes for free. And I ended up a couple, spending a couple of days a week there because that's how involved I got with that. The process yeah. was so exciting. You know, they're heating up uh, metal at 2,000 degrees and pouring it right there and you see what you buried at styrofoam which I used to think was terrible material and I grew to love it anyway Um, you see that emerge you Mm -hmm. dig that up a few hours later there was something so absolutely thrilling about it Um, so these different things made it somehow coming back to my main material I you know I felt refreshed about it and excited again yeah. because the illustration end has always been for me, not for them. <laughs> Is the um, uh, bench behind us one of your, your metal works? Yeah, like, it lost its wheels. They broke on the way to a, a show of them. I still approve. All these, yeah. Wow. So, and then I ended up going to a foundry after that. and. Mm-hmm. For a while, did pencil drawings and these little things with objects and, you know, whatever it was, because being bored would show. And yeah. and plus, who wants, I don't want to live like that. You yeah. know, you have to feel <laughs> this excitement in making something. I did a, um, a podcast about Nikki de saint uh, with with Nicole Rudick, who had done a biography of Nikki in Nikki's own words from the, the word paintings and other stuff and, and had this experience or feeling by the end of, you know, I could do metal sculpture in the backyard. I live out in the woods in New Jersey. I'm like, I could do stuff. And I, I lay down and the feeling passed. But, you know, I did have this this moment of thinking this would be the, the direction I would go in or at least start putting up these weird monuments in my backyard. Um Presumably to scare off any neighbors or deer, bear, and everyone else who comes wandering through. But yeah, I, I, seeing somebody actually follow through and pursue so many different forms of art um, always makes me feel terrible about myself. But I'm, I'm, glad, I'm glad for you. It's so connected. Yeah. It's not really separate. And I started to think that carving linoleum or wood or anything like that was really... Working in three, it is three dimensional, but that's 
what it is. It's very much related to the sculpture. Yeah. Of course, when there are, are these actively three-dimensional things, everything needed to be simplified and changed around. It wasn't working to try to translate it. Sure. But they're so related mm -hmm. that you know it comes together. Are there other forms you're interested in? Uh, or that you haven't tried yet? There are plenty I haven't tried yet. That you'd but, like to, you know, you know, is there yeah. a, outside of writing opera or something like that that occasionally <laughs> crops up in people's lives? Well, but, I got more and more interested in the writing, and I forgot to mention that before, that I rewrote it many, many times. Mm -hmm. And uh, just to make it one part relate to the other, and uh, I was concerned about it being you know, working enough, but also not saying exactly what the images do. So it's, I think it's kind of a difficult balance when there are words and images together, but it grew more interesting to me to yeah. work that way. In terms of the, not the ones that are text on the, the one page and facing image, but the ones with the text integrated? No, all Or of just it. throughout? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. the writing works. For me, but I, I did wonder about the challenges of the integrated text pages, where you're, where it's of a piece with with the illustration that you know, you have to be very confident or retouch everything afterwards to to fix things. But I didn't. I went with that, and yeah. actually, once it's incorporated into the image, I think it was kind of easier than writing it where it's more or less yeah, on its own floating. on a different page. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, because those work for me in in reading it. They they felt integral. Uh, they they felt like they were you know the the page itself was a piece of art, not just an image, but that whole integration worked you know fantastically. Mm -hmm. So don't sell yourself short on the writing stuff. Is is what mm -hmm. I'm saying. The the writing in oh. this and the selection of how you integrate and how you manage to run the whole book together really works. Mm -hmm. To that extent, what's your What's your history in graphic storytelling? Not the the illustration side, but you know what you've taught at SVA, what your your comics background is. How do you learn to tell a story graphically? Uh, reading is so, such an important part of it. Yeah, and trying to get to the essence of the story. Um, I think about it more and more about mystery being left in as part of it and not just totally giving it away and not to have to have everybody in the world understand it, but it has to communicate or it's not going to work. Uh, there's an audience somewhere, even if it's not everybody, and I don't want it to be everybody. It's whoever is going to respond to it the way it is. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the audience. and. I tell the students that, and I really object to the word commercial art, and that's another thing they hear continually. Yeah. Because why is this more commercial than art in a gallery? Mm -hmm. I don't get it. If you do it for yourself, and if it, if it works somehow, um, how is the word commercial that even people who do it attach to it? It's so offensive to me. Yeah. Yeah. So tell me about teaching. You've been at it at SVA since the late 70s? Yeah, since 1979. Okay. What did you learn in teaching and how have students changed over uh, 45 years? Okay, I have to hold my temper when they're on their phones during <laughs> critique. <laughs> Uh, well, um. I'll say that one of the people who connected us, Tom Woodruff, did. I think he mentioned it on mic um, that that yes, students were more sensitive of late to you know the 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 critique mindset uh, that that you know he had to learn to to adjust. But I'm pretty sure he said that on mic. At, at a minimum, I know he has said that in public before. So, but otherwise, yeah. tell me about uh, about teaching. Well. Um there's such a mixture of students, um, some who really want to have a good time in New York and others who are so dedicated and devoted that they even have homework parties with their friends, <laughs> and that is delightful. Hmm. Um, 
and seeing them meet, make their work uh, and go on with it, that's a thrill. Yeah. Um, yeah, and getting attached, and then they're gone and off, and I'm hoping to hear from them. You know, sometimes you do many years later. Yeah. So that's, that's the great part of it. That sense of legacy, and, and I've only inspired one or two people to launch their own shows in relation to this, but it does feel one of them stuck with it for about 200 episodes, so I feel pretty good. Wow. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah I was, that's impressive. You know, I, I'm, I'm always happy, mm -hmm. but, but yeah, that, that sense of, uh, I guess, um, how you stay on top of graphic storytelling trends, like how you, you know, keep from getting uh, uh, too codified or too, you know, fixed on a certain way of, of looking at storytelling. I wonder from a, a teaching side and what students are bringing uh, in terms of how they understand. Well, there's really a love of manga and the anime type of phases that pop up. I just, I find it tiresome unless they make them their own, and some people do, but often yeah. they don't. And it's hard to get away from there. And I've heard students say, I mean, this is the beginning of the semester still, that, oh, it looks great, because I'm always going to ask their opinion these days. But, and what does it matter if it, nobody understands it or it doesn't relate to the story anymore? And just hope with some time that that is going to... Yeah, that they'll know, learn other get, influences or bring yeah, in... Yeah, learn that it does matter. Uh, what it really comes down to is, even years ago, very few people ended up going into doing this. And some students do related work and are happy with it, and good. That's mm -hmm. what they want to do. Um, but I, I think, I hope that going to any school, going to this school in particular, will give them a feeling about reading and about other things that will contribute to their lives. It's not like they have to go out and be illustrators. Um, the unfortunate thing, and it's getting worse, is that people have to promote themselves and, and get their work out in ways that they hadn't some years ago. But the people who end up doing it, I think the amount of students who you know, the number has probably not changed an awful lot. But you see such great talent sometimes, and they just don't yeah. get their work out there because that's a whole different thing to deal with. Yeah, the, the social media push, the, the need to yeah. keep ranking up followers and likes, I can imagine right. that's not a one-to-one -one substitute for actual quality work getting to the right people. And, yeah, uh, which I encounter with this show all the time. Also, I, I that's why I do that newsletter instead of just pushing social media stuff because I figured there's a thousand people or so who actually read what I write yeah. every twice a week now. Mm -hmm. I mean, I pretend they do, um, but you know, they they at least see a new episode is out. Mm -hmm. They they follow some of the people I, I end up talking about on the show. But yeah, it's more personal. Yeah. yeah, and it's but again, I also do this for no money, so that's the the the, the trade off of this, as opposed to making it an actual profession or trying to make a career in, in illustration and art. As these guys are are you know, we hope they're headed towards. So tell me about your influences. Uh, and well, how they've changed. early on, um, you know, from looking at, from reading this book that. My grandfather's house had four apartments, and we were all related, and the doors were always opened, mm -hmm. and I was very close to it, everybody in the house. Um, my older cousins were really influential to me. Uh, the oldest cousin, Len, was an architecture student at Pratt and then an architect. And when I was about 10, he bought me this book, The Golden Encyclopedia of Art, that I have on the shelf yeah. over there. Um, and way in the back, there was a Kalvitz picture, Seeds for Sowing Must Not Be Milled. And there was a George Gross image, and they were very small in the back of the book. Um, 
And those were things that I gravitated towards. Uh, Annette brought back slides from the Louvre, and she gave me those slides. And there was a picture uh, of a clubfoot boy from Giuseppe di Ribera. And uh, that was something that also was, was so moving. So Mad Magazine, definitely. <laughs> and the older cousins read Mad Magazine, and it was in a room where we all gathered in my grandfather's little bungalow where... Mm-hmm. He put millions of us, you know. Yeah. Um, so having their older Mad magazines, and then eventually I got some of my own, but that was really a big... Gotcha. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> do, do you have one of those first Mad panel that blew your mind stories? Because I, I always think of... Um, Denny Eichhorn, Pete Bag illustrated uh, Denny Eichhorn's story about the, the first Mad Magazine. He saw it at his like, father's office when he was a little kid. He's sitting in the bathroom, and, and it was just this bag-ass <laughs> panel of this kid's brain exploding all over the place. But I forget what the actual panel was that he was mm. looking at, but... You mm. know. I love the lighter side of, and many other parts, and the ads on the back. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, I try and... It. I'm supposed to sit down with a... a David Mickix, who just edited a collection of cartoonists writing about the influence of Mad Magazine on them. Um, it's one of those, I'm trying to keep up with all the, the books that I need to, to sit down with guests for, and David and I have talked a few times, and it's one of those, this would be really good, I need to figure out when we can get over to Queens and, and sit down and talk. But, mm-hmm. but yeah, people like Roz and, and other folks just talking through those influences. It was great, and it was yeah. so... It stood out in yeah. those times, particularly. It was, you yeah. know, something it felt like everybody's going to get offended at this, and how wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you didn't make a differentiation with the, the high art and the, the Mad Magazine stuff. There was you didn't have any of those preconceptions or anything that oh no, this isn't real art. This is you know. For no, fun. I would not think that. But I don't yeah. know that it ever occurred to me that people actually did this and. Yeah. Did this for their work? Mm-hmm. No. And then you discovered yeah. this is going to be your life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so tell me about that, the, the, the career aspect of making art. I mean, you mentioned doing the illustration back in college, doing the, the line of cuts, but at what point did this become a, oh, this is actually what I want to do with my life? Well, I had some confusion about that because I'd wanted to be a photographer for a while. Yeah. And even had a job going into prisons and um, and mostly mental hospitals as a photographer, you know, as a work-study thing. And then, you know, I realized I'm, I'm quite a shy person and it wasn't really going to work out too well, I thought, as a photojournalist. And um, it wasn't where I discounted that completely, but... It didn't, you know, I got a job doing mechanicals at that time at Esquire in their promotion art department. It just happened when I got out of school and I got fired (laughs) for spilling ink and smearing (laughs) it. I started in trade magazines in 1995, at which point Quark and and InDesign already, or uh, uh, whatever the other page one was, they already existed. And I'm pretty sure that if I had come up during the, the era of mechanicals and paste ups, I would have no career whatsoever. <laughs> like yeah. I, I, the magazines would look like they were made by a serial killer. Things would have been terrible. <laughs> but luckily, things had gone digital by the time I arrived. But, mm-hmm. but yes, yeah, so it didn't work for you doing that mechanicals? Well, it worked for a while until I got fired. Yeah. And um, then when I went out to show my portfolio, I started to get illustration work, which had never occurred to me. And... I did book jackets. I love doing the book jackets because uh, the person who I did most of the work for was so open-minded and so just terrific. Um, so that was very exciting and combining type with images. And just being the designer, you could hire yourself in whatever way you wanted to express the contents. There were mostly young adult books for libraries. Uh, so that was great. And then just getting more work. And I wanted to have my work in the Times. Um, so that was another thing that I worked towards. Um, and that was 
a perfect fit, actually, because I guess there was always some background of interest in politics, and you know that came together in this book and in some other things. But that was perfect. Um, So I worked for the book review and for the op-ed page primarily, and that went on for years with other magazines and newspapers. Yeah, tell me about the political upbringing and the in the book, the union history of your your family underlays everything. But how aware were you of that growing up, or when did you become politically aware? I wasn't aware? that aware of it. I mean, my grandfather and my grandmother would go on conventions for the union. He had he chose to be a non uh, an unpaid union worker. He did not want to be paid. He was a volunteer uh, with the union and various things he did. And he was so passionate about it. Um, It wasn't what my father had wanted to do with his life, but he became a cutter. And it mattered to him to do it perfectly, as much as he could. And then so many people in the family were members of the union and worked making in clothing factories. So um, I went up to visit my father's, the factory where he worked when I was in college to take pictures, really. Um, And it wasn't the kind of um, Dickensian place that I kind of imagined. Uh, But also, you know, clock went off, and they had to go right back to their tables. That was the way that was, to to finish the work. Uh, So I guess I got more aware of that, and then even went to something that was organized in Washington. I went with my father and on the bus to Washington. And then the different groups of union members, the organization wasn't, done well enough and nobody could meet up and it was really very disappointing for the people who had gone and um, I I got to have more of a feeling for all of that and I also was very clear that my father and other people um, were doing a lot of work and they were not really profiting other than getting by, more or less, yeah. you know? And the union had made it possible for them to get by because conditions before the union were miserable. Yeah, yeah. So, so it was such a good thing, and yet it was sort of not surviving. Um, and in 1976, the union was no more, the amalgamated. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the history and the way you bring it in, it's, again, it's union and family and the history of Jews coming to America, which I'm first generation American, uh, Jewish immigrant, but, you know, they, they came over in the 60s, my, my parents. From where? Yeah. Well, Poland, Ukraine uh-huh. on mom's side, Romania and the Schwarzwald area of Germany on my dad's side into he was a refugee from Bucharest in 46, 47, gets to Palestine a few months before they declare independence. Mom, Zionist family in England, comes over to, to Israel in the 60s, and boom, Fort Lee, New Jersey, uh, 1965, yeah. and out to the, the woods and the sticks where they, they had me uh, six years later. But you know, seeing those those histories are always, to me, really compelling, the, the notion of what Jews did, especially coming to America, how they had to find trades they could be in, um, you know, and what it meant to to fight for their rights, both individually and as, you know, a collective workers group is, it matters to me, you know, and seeing how unions, you know, evolved and we'll say are having a resurgence in America, Mm -hmm. you know, fingers fingers crossed, crossed, you know, that's, that's, um, you know, I I find the book timely in, in, in that respect. But yeah, it's to me other uh, other histories of Jews in America, you know, are are catnip. So you know, speaking mm-hmm. of the cat, who's not trying to get into the bag right now. <laughs> <laughs> so your family members managed to survive through the war. Some, yeah, yeah. others, but not so much. The ones in Poland had a um, a tougher end. My mom's side got to England a generation before some of her family, uh, but a lot of them were still in Poland and in Ukraine and 
did not survive. Mm -hmm. Dad's much smaller family group and his his family amazingly made it through the war in Romania and then discovered the communists are going to be even worse and <laughs> basically hijacked a boat at gunpoint and, and fled for, uh, again, the only country that would take them, so or the only region that would take them. And, uh, and then they ended up here. So, mm -hmm. yeah, there's different ideas of what the American dream is, mm -hmm. especially for Jews. But, uh, you know, seeing how it plays out in the, the book and how your grandfather's perspectives on all the limitations and everything he put on the family, which you can say in retrospect, he meant for the best. He meant to, to make the kids focused and, and not frivolous. <laughs> you know, it, it's difficult, you know, it's, it's difficult to imagine what, what, you know, those upbringings were like as each generation goes by. Mm -hmm. That's me prattling on at length. This is more about mm -hmm. you. So mm -hmm. do you have other narrative work that you're, you're considering at this point? You mentioned another artist edition uh, earlier. But... Well, there were other editions uh, before this one. And yeah. this one, I don't know how long it's going to take to get it made. Um, this really great person, um, Peter Crudy, who is a lead press expert, uh, who did the work on Cry Uncle and put that together as well, um, we talked about putting this together and planned it mm -hmm. for years already. But it's become so monumental. There are so many images and so many pages to do in letterpress and then to put this thing together. And then we talked about it, arranging it in sections, um, because it can't be in a concertina with so many pages. Yeah. It's already unwieldy and it's stacks of paper and... I think the book will end up weighing about like 30 pounds or something crazy, <laughs> wow. really, because yeah. it's that many pages. This, so I, I have another podcast this afternoon. I parked here so I could bring this back to my car. So even this edition, I, I don't want to heft around the city all day long. But, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a lot. I don't know. And it had a lot of fold-out books. Yeah. Small fold-outs. You do have the one that's integrated in here. There's, There's just one, one, right? And I was really yeah. thrilled that yeah. Gary Groth, the publisher, editor, wanted to do that with it because I think it brings it together so well but that was a, a wonderful surprise that mm -hmm. he decided on that but there are many small books in the artist yeah. book what would be that edition yeah. and that, that's what I wonder this as a book versus this on a wall in an exhibition I know earlier versions of it um, exhibited at the Norman Rockwell Museum right. and, and yes. elsewhere you know, how much of it, I guess, how much of it is conceived as a book versus, you know, what it means to, to see this on a wall or to see the individual pages as objects? I didn't ever intend for the individual pages to be on a wall. I didn't think about okay. it, although it was really uh, a great experience to see them up there and mm -hmm. then to even have that kind of animated film they did yeah. with the little books moving. Mm -hmm. So that was great. But it did matter to me to have the little fold-outs and then it had to be rethought for this book. What would work for this instead of that mm -hmm. and not have it be a gap? Like there's an image with a pocket, the history... Uh, of the union forming uh, before 1914 when people worked 70 to 80 hours a week and then went on strike for a couple of months uh, and then the union was existing. But it was a fold-out book along of little images that folded into the pocket. Uh, so, and that's something we still have to deal with when doing the artist books because it's a little bulky and get it to stay put. So yeah, all these, well, I wonder how yeah. it lies flat. Basically, if every every page is swelling with with insets and right, and, so okay. that's something that we're going to have to deal with in, in the future and putting that together. I'm looking forward yeah. to seeing it. So you know, I, I don't know if I'll be able to have thirty pound book no, back from whatever like really place we meet. Have, but, going to be big, and then the but, box or whatever door thing it's going to be on the cover of it will have to be figured out, but that's that's in the future. Uh, it really mattered to me more to not to get this book in shape and get it out and um, so it's it's not that 
the actual pages in the artist book don't matter. They they do, but yeah. it's a separate but thing. It'll be a, its own yeah. production. And, and, and the thing that I'm working on now that I've gotten together in some form is too rough to even talk about because I tried to talk about it once and it seems so utterly ridiculous. That <laughs> that's like me and my I feelings. Think... <laughs> well, go on. That's, that's okay. Don't jinx anything. Oh, no. that's... <laughs> but I think I'm not going to you know nope. mention it until it sort of gets some kind of shape. Where, Just say I know. have an idea that I'm working on and, <laughs> yeah. and I'll, I'll. Yeah, and I did start a couple couple of blocks and I went into the print shop with yeah. the beginnings of it. Have you ever looked back at, at, have you ever considered trying to, to get back into illustration? I mean, commercial work like that, or is it really no, no. totally in the past for you? No, it's in the past. Maybe somebody will have some idea for a one-off thing. Like I just did something for World War Three. Oh, cool. I guess it was some months ago, but that's a separate no, thing as Peter I'm and interested and, yeah. in, in stories and in series and in text with it that I write. Mm -hmm. um, so that's for the foreseeable future. That's what I want to do. Yeah. Looking forward to it. What are you reading? Uh, well, I'm reading a book called Who Owns This Sentence about copyright. It's fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, and the two authors are basically saying that corporations now own the rights to so much of our culture. And they make a very good case for how wrong this is, because other than a number of years that protect the maker, for something to go on under copyright for 75 or 100 years, and to then have vast amounts of money that has to be paid to, to refer to it yeah. without being sued, and no one can say you can't be sued for such and such, even if it's relatively small, you know, it then goes uh, defending your rights and all of that get nearly impossible against big corporations. The book is really interesting in the history, in the history of it and how this occurred from a few hundred years ago. So I haven't finished that yet. Yeah, but well, we blame Disney for a lot of it, just trying to keep Mickey Mouse under control. Yeah, they're but, part of it. You know, yeah. I, I had this with um, Stephen Shepard a few weeks ago, or last month. We recorded one about his biography of J.D. Salinger. And apparently, and this may come up in your, your book, Salinger's letters were in a university. A biographer referred to them, used them you know, for material in a biography, and he sued for the right to control his own letters, which, again, had been sent off to a university collection at that point, and won. And the guy had to take out every reference to each of these letters, and the Supreme Court wouldn't take up the case. So currently, law of the land from the 80s onwards is the author can give permission or deny permission to, to quote from their letters, even if it's decades and decades old. Yeah, it's really unfortunate, because uh, what they point out in this book is that a culture of a place shouldn't be owned to that kind of degree, yeah, yeah. where everything is based on what came previously, um, then it's a fascinating book. Yeah. In the music that I use for the intro, if you ever listen to the podcast, I is, have this in, it's I, Hal Mayforth, another illustrator and, and artist, uh, lives up in Massachusetts and also makes music. And previously i've been using commercial music by a past guest who gave me permission to use it and youtube just started striking my episode saying you're using unauthorized audio you can't do this and i asked how can i just use like a 10 second clip here oh yeah gil no problem and he's not a big recording artist so there was no label to, to worry about or any weird ai identifying me as, mm -hmm. as a thief but yeah we're, we're in this weird age where we're you know caught by copyright i guess yeah. I yeah. wanted to use something. Um, you know, I mentioned that I'm still really influenced and uh, overwhelmed and want to incorporate things from, from Orwell. Uh, and I'm just wondering about what is permissible and what isn't and what needs, what needs permission. Uh, because some things are clear you can use in, for an artist book. Yeah. It's not going What's to fair use be versus, matter. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but fair use is iffy as well. So that 
I don't know. Sometimes you take a chance and other times yeah. not. Um, so tell me about I, your, uh, as an Orwell geek, tell me yeah. about your Orwell background. What's your... Uh, well, you know, from childhood, yeah. uh, 1984, but then afterwards, you know, why I write and the essays in that about language. Yeah. Um, those are great. And the view from Wigan Pier about him going into the coal mines, you know, absolutely fascinating. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I was more of an essay guy than the, the fiction, so I'm glad you, you, you glom onto the nonfiction side of things yeah. with him. So, yeah. yeah, I mean, it's easy to quote 1984 to, to use that as a, a reference point. But yeah, it's um, I, I did one recently with Laura Beers. We had an episode about her teaching Orwell in the modern in contemporary university situations. And as you were saying with students at SVA, they come in with a very different framework than than we had. And it's not... Um, there are a lot of assumptions we have that you have to wait. They're going to question things in a very different way than, than we are. Not in terms of saying, you know, freedom versus non-freedom, but a lot of the colonial history and everything Orwell's bringing into it are things that are either alien to them or anathema. Like they're just opposed to discussing shooting an elephant and and pieces like that. Oh, I didn't so, want to think about that piece. <laughs> yeah. See, it's, it yeah. takes you in a very, very yeah. different direction when yeah. you take somebody who's 20 years old now as opposed to... Mm -hmm. You know us and our, our especially Cold War history, but but again, that's 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 part of getting old. I've discovered is you know I, I'm passe in a whole lot of different ways. So besides uh, you know who owns a sentence, uh, what else you've been reading? Uh, very recently, Laura Siegel, who just died, I, I and read, yeah. I had uh, one of the books. Uh, I've had that for a while, so I only started to read that. And I got one of the children's books just because it seems so irresistible, and it really is. Um, the Mitzi stories mm -hmm. are really funny and charming. Uh, and I'm reading a book um, more about labor these days by Stephen Greenhouse, which is fascinating. I haven't finished that yet. Uh, what I read recently, um, a graphic novel, Voices... Voices in the Dark. Is that Uli Lust? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm glad I remember. It's I know great. where it is on my it's shelf. I haven't memory. read it yet, but yeah. Yeah, I've met Uli a few times. She's wonderful. So, uh, And read the uh, the big one that Fanta did. Um, today is the first or the last day of the rest of oh, your I life or something I only have seen like that. parts of that, but yeah, that I'd was, love it. Uh, I was at the Small Press Expo when that was launched and won the, uh, the big award, and it was one of those brick of a, a graphic novel, uh, and I was like, oh, I am grabbing this one and, and you know I'll, I'll spend my time reading that when I get home mm -hmm. but but yeah she's she's something but actually something I, I wonder about we, you mentioned the students you've worked with over the years and your own influences have you seen your influence in other artists not in a plagiaristic way or anything but you know just just artists you've seen oh they have picked up on no, I don't notice that, and I don't know that I would be particularly pleased with that anyway. <laughs> um, I have an Ed Sorrell story yeah. that I'll tell you off mic about okay. that sort of thing, but okay. but yeah, it's just yeah, the, I, you know, I don't know if people like... want them to be themselves, and sure. sometimes it's not at all what I'm thinking, because uh, even looking back at some students where maybe I didn't think their drawing was what it could be, or they should spend more on that, and then... They are very successful in something that I hadn't imagined. Um, or when the drawing's so exceptional and I'm not really understanding what they want to say with it. And, you know, it's been very instructive because I hope to stay away from that kind of criticism now or even implication that it's something that I don't love because it has nothing to do with what they are making. Yeah. yeah. Um, as far as children's books, there are some that are so absolutely great and brilliant and have friends who do the most beautiful ones. But I can be a little dismayed sometimes if somebody's going into a, a children's book thing and making sweet work when they don't have to make it like that. Yeah. But, you know, I'm trying to stay. Yeah, the personal away taste from thing versus. That. Yeah, 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 because it shouldn't feed into it. And it's going to to some extent, but. If that's kept to a minimum, that's probably yeah. better. There's always the, not my cup of tea, but I get what you're doing with, with this. Right. I, I had that with one artist who I won't name, 
who people warned me, like, he's going to ask you what you think of his big graphic novel. He never did um, when we recorded. But, you know, my, my response that I was ready for was, it, it's not my thing, but I get, you know, the audience here you're making this for is you. I get why a whole lot of other people dig it. It's just, you know. But yeah. luckily, that never came up. We had a real good conversation about work in general. and, and Yeah, it's yeah. good when it doesn't come up. Yeah. And if somebody is doing what they want and with excitement and with real care, that's what's going to matter. Yeah. Yeah. Did you ever get in Mad Magazine or not? Did I get in Mad? Yeah. No. Oh. No, and I didn't try. Okay, I wondered if that was ever a, a career you know, aspiration. You know, I was so <laughs> involved with having things in the Times and the Nation and the Progressive and the well, Washington the, Post the and Times. serious places, but, but well, still. Well, um, you know, now I think, gee, if I did more, uh, you know, if I did other things, but then what seems to be... The reality is that you do what you're making at the time that seems right then and not like when you're much older looking back at it yeah. when it's too late anyway, but it wasn't the right time to do a particular thing then. I get you. You've, from everything I can tell, from all the prep I did leading up to this, you have managed to keep evolving as a, an artist and, and we see here a storyteller in ways that I'm hoping my next 20 plus years will, will also bring. So you know, thank you for being a great example on top of, you know, being an amazing artist and, uh, and I'll say writer, you know, I, oh, I think you. not just in terms of the prose, but you know, what comics or graphic storytelling is, is, mm. you know, that, that fusion. So. Thank you. You know, what puzzles me still is that there is such a division between what people call comics and books that don't fit in exactly into that. Yeah. And I I don't understand why they're... You know, I do understand that people who've collect, collected comics for years feel that way. But yeah. it sort of puzzles me to have been asked several times about that when I just think, okay, so you make pictures and images and you do it in the way that that makes sense for you. Why does it have to be in a particular format? Sure. You no, know, so I'm kind of getting both, but yeah. I, I still think that <laughs> no, I don't I, understand I, it. I think part of it was marketing. You know, we have yeah. to say what what department this goes into in the bookstore, and there's always the territorial vibe. Oh, no, no that's not comics. This is a graphic novel. You know, that the people had to start trying to, to set things off a bit. It reminds me of one of the people who connected us, Thomas Woodruff. I try and explain what that book of his is. It's not exactly comics. It's, as he put it, you know, an opera that's been translated into a graphic form, which is as close as any other description. And I love a world where those things exist, where there isn't an easy category to drop stuff uh -huh. into. But we can say, yeah, it's comics. You know, it's it's... Got this brother. Yeah, uh, it's such a beautiful book. And the great thing is that, you know, at Fantagraphics, he doesn't limit it. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's not. He's open to different ways of yeah. making pictures and putting them together in a book, yeah, which known, is just unusual and yeah. a I've, great I've, thing. I've known Gary for many years. I was mistaken for Gary for years back in the Comics Journal in the 90s yeah. because... People thought Gil Roth was a, a pseudonym for, for Gary uh, because I was writing <laughs> relatively mean-spirited uh, uh, capsule <laughs> reviews of some comics. But, um, but yes, we got to meet in person and determined that we were not the same person, so it, it, it worked pretty well. But, right. but yeah, the idea that you know there's a publisher out here and that printing technology has gotten uh -huh. to the point at which this can exist in a, I'll say, affordable you know, format is... That's one of the biggest changes for me in the last 10 or 20 years is seeing books that, like, you couldn't have made this in the 80s or 90s. Right. Yeah. Without making it a $300 book or something like that. Um, I never had a crazy amount of money to spend, but I've spent two, in the past $200 on a book that had a few images I liked yeah. <laughs> just because that, and they weren't even produced anywhere near the way things yes, were. Yes, but you even, needed at least that representation. Yeah. I have two past guests who had the exact same description of a collection that they had bought by a British soap opera cartoonist back in the 50s. I think his name was David Wright. 
the first one told me, he showed me some of the, the illustrations, uh, the, the cartooning. It's absolutely phenomenal. Incredible use of hatching. This real gorgeous, gorgeous work. That was just printed in like 1953 on, on shitty newsprint in, in England. He said, it cost $350. Didn't tell my wife how much I paid for it. <laughs> Mention this to an artist he's friends with. Say, hey, have you ever read the, the David Wright books? Like, oh, God, yeah. Didn't tell my wife how much I paid for it. But <laughs> <laughs> So apparently that, that is a category for these yeah. things of, you know, right. the really important books. We don't quite talk about how much we're, we're willing to blow on these things. But, right. but yeah, it's, it's, it's a different world now. So I'm glad we're, we're getting a lot more yes. of this stuff. And I'm awfully glad this book exists. Oh, thank you. I, I wanted to mention just another book and yeah. maybe show you maybe when oh, we're sure. done. Um, David Barona, who uh, was, uh, he ran the library at Plymouth State, and he bought my book, Cry Uncle, for that library. And then I was lucky enough to meet him. He, he really he died tragically and young. Mm -hmm. But he wrote, uh, he put together a book called, um, what is it called? Wordless Books. I'm, mm -hmm. not, I'm probably not getting it right. Okay, I have it on it the, the show shelf. Notes, but yeah. Okay. Yeah. And it showed work of someone I'd never heard of, Otto Nuckel. Do you know Otto no, Nuckel's work? Not at all. Hey, so then um, I got a Dover edition of the book, but I also went to the New York Public Library in their collection and saw the original book from the original, I think they might be lead prints, and it was all spotted and everything because it wasn't done on you know, acid-free paper, but it was so remarkable. So then I went about looking for one of my own rather than continually course, having yeah. to go up there. <laughs> and my mother bought it for me for my birthday. But it was only $100, and it came from somebody in Australia. So I got it from there, and I have that. And you can't compare it. You know, Dover's great for printing these things up, but the yeah, beauty but of the, this book yeah. and the original prints and... It's funny to me that first editions of that book, Destiny, mm -hmm. cost a lot more than <laughs> this book with, you know, pulled prints. Yeah. But it's really a wonderful thing I to always have. like knowing the things we would grab in case there was a fire in the house. There's the, <laughs> the, I have a little stack of things that I, I know are irreplaceable. Everything else you can deal with. But yeah, there's a few things like one of Barbara Nessam's sketchbook facsimiles. I'm like, well, that's clearly on the path to, to grab and, and head out of the house with. But but, good. but we'll take a look at it. In the meantime, Francis, thanks so much for, for coming on the show. And thanks for thanks for spending 12 years plus on, on this book because it was, it was a marvel. I'm glad that I have guests who say, Gil, this is exactly the book you need to read and the person you need to talk to. So thank you. Thank you, Gil. And that was Francis Jetter. Go get her new book, Amalgam, An Immigrant, His Labor Union, and His American Family in Brooklyn, from Fantagraphics Underground. It's a phenomenal piece of storytelling. Like I said in the episode, in ways it's kind of reminiscent of Thomas Woodruff's Francis Rothbard book from a couple of years ago, just in terms of blurring a lot of comics barriers and becoming something else entirely. So... I hope you give it a read. Now, Francis's site, fjetter.net, which is F-J-E-T-T-E-R dot net, uh, that's got a ton of her work to, to ogle over. I, she's been around a long time. I mentioned she's been teaching at SVA since 1979. She has had a long career, and her site includes prints, drawings, book jackets, illustrations, a lot of illustrations, uh, artist books, sculptures, and, and more along with a more comprehensive bio and, and CV. She really has an amazing body of work. And I'm going to say I sort of plotzed when she showed me some of the work in her studio uh, when I, I came to visit, uh, including some of those artist books, these, these, well, just these huge oversized editions, limited, very, very limited, like 10 or 15 of them. And you know how she talks about that Japanese handmade paper at the the beginning of the episode. I got to see what some of that stuff looks like, and it's uh, wow. She has devoted her life to her art, and um, and I'm awfully thankful I got to sit down with her for a conversation. Now, you can support the Virtual Memories Show by 
telling other people about it. Let them know this show comes out every week with really fascinating conversations with interesting, creative people. You can also help out the show by telling me what you like and don't like about it or who you'd like to hear me record with or what movie or TV show or book or piece of music or theater or art exhibition or whatever you think I should check out and, and turn listeners on to. And you can do that by sending me an email, uh, DM if we're connected on Instagram or Blue Sky, um, by postcard or letter. I, I do a, an email newsletter twice a week, and I have my mailing address at the bottom of that. That's buttondown.email slash vmspod. If you don't get that already, sign up. Um, you can unsubscribe really easily, but you can get my mailing address there and send me a real letter. You can also use Google Voice, and that's 973-869-9659. Call that. goes directly to voicemail, so you don't have to worry about getting stuck in an awkward conversation with me. And uh, messages can be up to three minutes long, so it'll cut you off after that. Just call back and leave another message if you uh, if you get cut off. And tell me if it would be cool to include whatever you have to say with our, our listeners, because... You might have something interesting, but I'd never run something like that without uh, the speaker's permission, you know? Now, if you got money to spare, don't give it to me. Uh, give it to other people. Give it to institutions in need. Find people you can help. Um, you can use those crowdfunding platforms like GoFundMe, uh, Patreon, Kickstarter, Indiegogo, all those things. You'll find people who need help making rent or medical bills or car payment or veterinary bills or, um, well, getting an artistic project going, whatever it is, they might be in a position where a couple of dollars from you can make a real difference in their lives. And with institutions, I give to my local food bank and World Central Kitchen every month. I make other charitable contributions and uh, election contributions because that's part of my job as a lobbyist. Um, but you can find different charities and, and different foundations out there that, uh, again, could use your money to, to try to help build a better world. So, um, give, man. Our music for this episode is Fella by Hal Mayforth. Use with permission from the artist. You should visit my archives to check out my episode with Hal from the summer of 2018 and learn more about his art and painting. And you can listen to his music at soundcloud.com slash Mayforth. And that's M-A-Y, the number four, T-H. And that's it for this week's episode of the Virtual Memories Show. Thanks so much for listening. We'll be back next week with another great conversation. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show and download past episodes at the iTunes Store. You can also find all our episodes and get on our email list at either of our websites vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. You can also follow the Virtual Memory Show on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod, at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com, and on YouTube, Spotify, and tunein.com by searching for Virtual Memories Show. And if you like this podcast, please tell your pals, Talk it up on social media and go to iTunes, look up the Virtual Memories Show, and leave a rating and maybe a review for us. It all goes to helping us build a bigger audience. You've been listening to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth. Keep reading, keep making art, and keep the conversation going. 